everyone. My name is Maria Bloyer, and I'm thrilled to have you here for yet another edition of Special Education Thursday, where we take a complicated topic and do a really tight little deep dive onto a narrow part of it. Um, and today we're talking about one of DC's most unique education landscape features, which is the lottery. Um, and we're really going to talk about what families need to know um, about the lottery if they have a student with a disability, and that includes a 504 plan or an IEP. I'm really happy to be here today with um, one of my favorite folks from um, my school, DC, who are the folks who run um, the lottery, for those of you who don't know, um, Michelle DeSanto, who is just a wealth of knowledge, and I'm going to let you, in, let you, Michelle, introduce yourself and uh, tell everybody a little bit about you. Yeah. So um, thank you very much for having us here. Um, this is some of my favorite topics to discuss. Um, I am the parent response manager for my school DC. Um, and this means that I lead the part of the team that directly responds to parents. If you call our hotline, if you email us, if you email somebody else in the city about the lottery, it will eventually end up with us and um, we will help you with it. Um, I... Uh, yeah, so pretty much my day is helping people navigate uh, the lottery. Perfect. And you said you work for My School DC, and this was something that confused me for the longest time. Like, mm -hmm. where does My School DC fit in the in the whole landscape thing? Like, yeah. where does it go? That is an excellent question, and we kind of have an, a unique history at My School DC because we were started as a um, a sort of um, quasi-governmental organization. Um, we had charter schools and DCPS as our stakeholders, parents as our stakeholders, and we worked out of the DME. Um, but our goal was always to be a self-sustaining government agency. So we moved over here to the Office of the State Superintendent for Education and um, working here. Um, the reason is, is that we work for, as a lot of people know, there are the traditional school system here, DCPS, and then our vibrant charter sector. And we work for both sectors and we are completely neutral. So we needed a nice neutral place to be able to help both schools and parents. Okay, that's a great question. And I didn't know that you started off, I knew you were at the DME's office. I didn't know you started mm -hmm. off as like a quasi government. Yeah. So you learn something new every day. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll we'll just kind of dive right into the content and start with just this baseline question. Mm -hmm. um, if you're if you're a parent and your child has an IEP or a 504 plan or you think they might need one of those things, mm -hmm. can you participate in the lottery? Yes, of course. Okay. okay. Um, and if you participate in the lottery and you wind up changing schools. Do you as a family need to start all over um, with the whole IEP process and like your IEP evaporated when you enter the lottery and when you get to your new lottery placement, you, you need to get a whole new IEP and go through a whole process again? Is that something that happens? No, what should happen is that when you're matched to a school and you go to enroll, when you as the parent feel ready, you can provide your IEP. Um, schools will also get access to IEPs um, sometime in mid to late July so that they can be prepared for your student. You want the new school to be prepared to help your student with any supports that they need, but the school should also do a reevaluation. Um, within the first, I believe it's 60 days, if I'm not incorrect, Maria, um, mm -hmm. just to see, not to wipe out the IEP, but just to give it another look and, and bring uh, new supports to the student. Right. Yeah. We usually call that um, a 30 day review or like a 60 okay. day review. When you get to the yeah. new place, you're going to yeah. kind of localize that IEP. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that, you know, entering the lottery doesn't mean you are giving up an IEP or walking away from one. I've had a couple of parents say to me, well, I can't do the lottery because my kid has an IEP and I don't want to start all over again. And yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. I was going to say, even for those families that are in transitioning and say you might have a student who's outplaced at a private school, even if you are transitioning, you're welcome to use the lottery. And most schools um, will, if they can't serve your student, you know, help you um, maintain that placement. Um, so don't be afraid of using the lottery. <laughs> Perfect. Um, that's that's a really, I think, good bottom line is like, don't be afraid of the lottery. 
Mm -hmm. And then you you mentioned something about like, you know, if a student, if a school can't serve a student, how mm -hmm. how can families know? I mean, I know we have some answers to that, but I wonder mm -hmm. from your point of view, how do families know whether or not a school can serve their student? You would have to talk to the school. That's also a spot here with my school, D.C., that we have to be as general and neutral as possible. So I can support you and tell you that every school um, should accept you no matter what your student's level of need is. Um, but it is true that some schools simply can't support you and will need your um, will need to look for a place that can. For school searches, um, I oftentimes send um, parents to, um, to the HAE for recommendations because you guys can be, you don't have to be as neutral as we are about it. Yeah. Well, I think two things. One, I always tell parents to look on the My School DC website. Um, mm -hmm. All of the schools have a special education contact listed, mm -hmm. um, yeah. which is huge. That's really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a question sheet. Yes. That's really helpful for a lot of families. Um, mm -hmm. And it is, it is, I will freely admit it's tough because the law says that every school has to, every LEA has to be able to serve the full continuum of disabilities. And we have some very small LEAs in DC. Right. Um, and there are limits there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so figuring out what can they actually do on day mm -hmm. one. Um, so we have some good questions for that and I'll drop those in the comments. Um, mm -hmm. But that's that's a good point. Um, and I appreciate you saying what you said about your role being that of like a neutral. Um, mm -hmm. But I also think that you provide a really good resource with the yeah. um, with the contact. Like I sometimes use that when I'm like, yeah. figure out who's supposed to be the bed contact <laughs> at this school. I'm like, my school DC has that nailed yeah. down. Um, so what about, what about application schools? Can you talk a little bit about you know, the ability of students with disabilities to access application schools? Is that like a thing? Can you can you walk me through that? Yeah, I know some families um, are concerned that maybe their students wouldn't thrive in that environment. But no, there's nothing keeping you um, from applying to application or as we call them, the selective citywide high schools um, at all. Um, and you can always check with the school to, um, you know, see what supports they have already in place. Um, and there are some schools that will, even if you need um, supports during the application um, process, um, give you, um, for instance, you know, depending on what they're asking for um, in their additional steps, um, they should be able to accommodate um, disabilities mm -hmm. for them. Yeah, and they should, I mean, this is me kind of switching gears from being happy, friendly host to being, you know, civil rights lawyer, um, not only should they, they kind of have to. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, yes. Um, that's that's really helpful. Um, and I think what you said earlier about talking to the school and figuring out what makes sense um, is really important there. Yeah. Um, so I actually do. I'm sorry, Maria. I was going to say, I actually use your set of parent questions to send to parents um, that are, you know, requesting, how do I talk to a school about it? Or what do I do? Especially helpful for those new parents who are new to having a student with a disability and needing that help. Yeah. Um, thank you. That makes me happy. I'm really, really, I like that document a lot. So that brings me some joy. Um so I, I was going to ask, and you kind of answered this a little bit, but I want some some clarity about it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one thing that parents are often worried about is, you know, is the school going to treat my child differently mm -hmm. or decline access because mm -hmm. they have a 504 or an IEP? Mm -hmm. um, and I know you said that early in the application process, some of that gets disclosed, but then the actual application, or maybe I misheard you. Um, mm -hmm. but then the school doesn't actually get the IEP until mid, you know, mid to late July. Mm -hmm. Um, when, when does, when do the schools that you're applying to in the lottery find out that a student has a disability? So it is not part of the application process okay. as it should not be. Okay? okay. Unless you, there is a charter school that offers a preference, um, for you to get into their, um, self-contained or high-level classrooms. Um, they will get access to your IEP early to see that if you qualify. Um, other schools will only get it when you either provide it or they have access over the summer to it. Now, 
when I was talking earlier, this is a delicate subject um, for a lot of parents. I we want to be able to talk to the school openly about your student, but there is a fear that you'll get counseled out before you even get to enroll or anything like that. And the only thing I can really offer for parents is if during the enrollment process, if you've been matched to a school through the lottery, and during the enrollment process, you're finding that you think that they may not want to complete enrollment because of your student's um, status or IEP or 504 plan, that's when you call me. And it is my job to help defend that match as best I can um, for a parent. Um, and it generally can work out, but no, people do have trouble, which is some of the, it's one of the special things that um, families with students with disabilities have to, well, have to go through, which, yeah, I'm not, not saying that with the, the sympathy that I actually truly do feel. I'm sorry, that was more bureaucratic than I meant, but it's tough, and I'm not going to lie that it, you may run into problems, and that is when you call our hotline and you speak to me, if it's something I can't handle, I get you to who I think can. Yeah, um, so one, I, I appreciate the fact that you acknowledge that it's tough because I know that it's something that a lot of families worry about. Mm -hmm. um, I will also say that since I've been practicing, I've really seen a shift and mm -hmm. there's a lot less of the counseling out than I used to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's always that always makes me happy. Um, but it is it is tricky. Um, and and one question that families have asked me that I don't know the answer to is um. Is there a way for families to keep schools from knowing about their students' disability status until after enrollment? It depends. If your student has an IEP that is already recorded in the system, it's in the database um, here at Aussie, schools will get it. Um, and, you know, because they do need to prepare. Um, so I don't know if there's a way for, um, if your student is already in the system, so to speak, to keep it from schools necessarily um, mm -hmm. at that moment. I generally, unless your student has a super high level of need or something very specific or unusual, I recommend, you know, not letting, you know, um, just so that it you know that it's not a part of the enrollment process. But I also encourage families, it's when you feel comfortable as well. Yeah, I think that's really the key thing. I mean, like everything else in special education, it's a case by case decision, family by family, school by school, child by child. Um, you know, and I, I just didn't know the answer to whether because parents asked me, it's like, you know, yeah. can I keep the school from knowing? I'm like, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, and definitely yeah. not if there's an IEP. A yeah. um, little fuzzier if there's a 504 plan because there isn't a, a citywide data tracking system for 504s, yeah. but definitely not on the IEP side. Um, so I would, sorry to interject, mm -hmm. Ray, I don't know if we want to talk about this now, but um, DCPS will know. Um, and I don't know if you want, would you like me to, yeah. So for those families who are DCPS families, um, your IEP is there um, and accessible, and DCPS has a p policy that they are enforcing, which is if your student has a location of services letter, a very specific thing telling you that this is the DCPS school best suited to serve your student, they will not um, enroll you at another DCPS school um, because they have made that de determination. Um, so again, those schools will have access to it. So not necessarily if you're the moment you're matched to them, but they have access to look that up um, if you're matched or before you get a waitlist offer. Right. And I think that was actually going to be my next question is, can we talk about the, the DCPS issue? Because that, yeah. is, that is a big question we get. Yeah. Um, and I think the way you phrased it is probably better than the way I phrase it. Um, because you know we have families where they go through the lottery, they pick a school that can implement mm -hmm. the, the IEP, a mm -hmm. DCPS school that can implement the IEP, and then mm -hmm. DCPS changes and says, well, that's not the location we want your child to go to. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and, it, and it's not about the ability to implement the IEP, it's about mm -hmm. what, what the agency decided. Yes. Um, so you actually, I will borrow the way you said that, that was much better than the way I usually say it. Yeah. Um, 
So that that is helpful. And I, you kind of also answered my question about like what happens if I get a placement through the lottery and they can't yeah. implement the IEP. You know, that's yeah. going to be moving within the LEA or looking at mm -hmm. an IEP. Um, right. Yeah, so that, that makes perfect sense. Um, another question that we get a lot about is, um, you know, entering the lottery um, as a student who is maybe, you know, very little and has mm -hmm. a disability at mm -hmm. the early stages part. And a lot of families, I think, are interested in, you know, the placements offered by early stages, which mm -hmm. are PPS placements, but they're also interested in charter school placements. Yes. So I'm wondering yeah. if you could kind of talk through anything that you think families should think about there or anything they should worry about um, as they're entering with, you know, a young child with a disability in particular. Yeah. I have no reservations suggesting to people to apply to charter schools, um, especially since if um, early stages may also, um, in some cases, give you a location of services. Again, that's not changeable. So charter schools are there um, for whatever reason you might want to apply to a charter school over the DCPS school that they feel is better to serve your needs. So no, I am. Um, and as you said, I've also noticed um, over the years, there's much less counseling out. There's much less turning people away um, from DCPS. And But specifically here, I want to mention charter schools. Um, and I do also want to take a moment to tell a parent, if, you know, once we've run the lottery, if you have trouble with enrolling or you get pushback for any reason, that is when you call the My School DC hotline, or you can call the AJE. But like I said, we are here to help defend that match, help to sort it out for you. And we do it on the hotline from the parent perspective. You guys are our constituents. You are the ones that we want to help and make sure that your match sticks. I love the way you said that too. Like you guys are there to make sure the match works, um, which is part of like enabling parent choice and, and how the system is supposed to work. Um, so those were kind of my list of questions. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to recap a couple of things you said though, mm -hmm. which I think are so important, which is like talking to the school is important. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason not to apply and not to try the lottery really. Right. Um, you know, it's worth doing and it doesn't mm -hmm. hit a magic reset button. Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is really important. Um, is there anything, is there any kind of closing thoughts you want to leave us with? Um, I will share all of the contact information and all the resources yeah. you shared with us, um, which is always helpful. I really mm -hmm. appreciate how you guys get this. Yeah. We just totally forgot all about our slides. <laughs> um, so I've seen the slide where it says, where can parents go to learn more and what are some favorite resources? Honestly, for me, it is, we have the, as you said, the SPED coordinator um, for most of the schools on their school profile, check with them. I also think that the um, workshops given by AJE and um, the Ombudsman's SPED hub are invaluable. Um, I, you know, would do that. And um, there is some information that I do want parents to treat um sort of judiciously, let me say. Um, a lot of people find out like that DCPS has certain schools that have certain programs, specialized classrooms and things like that. And parents need to remember that when you do that, you're lottering into the school and not their program. So as you mentioned, Maria, even if they you know they can serve you, if you haven't been placed there, you won't be enrolled there. Um, so not all information is going to be necessarily useful to you. Um, mm -hmm. So... If you do learn about schools that have self-contained classrooms, call the school, talk to them, see how you get in there, if the lottery is the way to do it or not. Yeah, and I think that's really good advice because you're lottering into the school, not the program. Mm -hmm. And then um, some LEAs do this more than other LEAs. And, and I think DCPS candidly does it a lot yeah. more than other LEAs, which mm -hmm. is treat, you know, IDA like a trump card. And it's like, well, I can yeah. trump your lottery placement. So that's absolutely <laughs> yeah. really frustrating for families too. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and I agree that list that I think, you know, we we share it every time we get it, the list of where all the self-contained classes are, because yes. that's important and families need to know that. Mm -hmm. But you can't rely on it. No, not in, yes, not in conjunction with the lottery. I would, if I was a parent wanting to use that, that's when I would talk to your IEP team about your placements and about your student and where they, even for transitions, where they're going um, so that you can be, 
be a part, an active part about choosing, helping your IEP team choose where the location of service is for your students. No, I agree. And I think it's it's an interesting intersection because it's an interesting intersection where we could talk about that whole placement mm -hmm. versus location all day long, but oh, we're yeah. not going to do that. We are not going to do that to Courtney <laughs> um, <laughs> or our listeners because that yes. is quite the topic. Oh, yes. What we're going to do now is take a little bit of a break. We're going to pause things and then mm -hmm. um, the faces are going to change. The talking mm -hmm. heads are going to be different. Okay. Um, but the conversation is going to be pretty much the same.